Good morning. May I have your attention? Thank you for joining us for this special presentation highlighting National Forensic Science Week. My name is Yudeta Aguino, and I am the Census Board Coordinator at Marshall Law National Service Manager. Before I introduce our special guests, I would like to make a big announcement. To our guests in the audience, and to those joining us via live stream, this presentation is being recorded and will be available on the Bear County YouTube channel. Additionally, I would like to extend a warm welcome to the high schools within the Northside Independent School District and any other schools and community members in the surrounding areas who are joining us. On September 6th, the proclamation by the Bear County Commissioners Board was made and declared September 18th through 24th, 2022 as Forensic Trans Week in Bear County. At this time, I would like to ask Mr. Pena to the point for an introduction and presentation by the Board of Good morning, Marshall High School. Good morning. And uh, good morning to our online audience. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. We're really excited. My name is Tom Heine. I'm an Assistant Public Information Officer for Bear County. Why am I talking to you today? I'm certainly not a scientist, um, but as the, as the department that is tasked with telling the residents of Bear County all the different things that we do for you, uh, we felt that National Forensic Science Week was a particularly interesting subject and give you a little bit of insight as high school students as to what our crime lab actually does. We know there's a lot of stuff out there from TV shows and movies and what people think they might do. And today, Aaron Reed, who is the Assistant Director of the Bear County Crime Lab, will shed a little light on what is true and what is maybe not so true. Um, real quick, uh, for, my, for my background, I have a little bit of knowledge about this. I used to be a Deputy Sheriff in Arizona for 10 years and worked as a detective as well. So I can tell you forensic science is absolutely critical. And it is critical that we have young people like yourselves interested in this field to carry it on because it will only become more important as the criminal justice system is, uh, is working its way through the latest development and uh, it, it really has provided great assistance in complicated and most complex cases. Because if you find yourself one day during jury, in jury duty uh, and you will have to sit there and listen to people talk to you about a criminal case, Maybe your decision to declare if somebody is guilty of a crime that they've been uh, that they've been accused of or not guilty, then hopefully this will give you a little bit of an appreciation of what goes into that and how the folks at the crime lab try to be helpful and, and assist in this process. Enough being said from uh, from my side here. Uh, oh, and I forgot one thing: uh, the question and answer. Part. Yeah. So especially for our online. Uh, uh, you can use the comment section on our Bear County YouTube channel to post your questions. We'll monitor it throughout. After Aaron's presentation, there will be an opportunity for folks here uh, in the auditorium as well as online, and we try to get to as many questions as possible. With that, I give it to the man with the coolest beard in the <laughs> of criminal justice, uh, Aaron Reed. Thank you. Good morning. I hope that you guys are awake. I know that it's an early release day for you, so you're like, can we just get through this and just get home? I've got video games to play. Um, but I also understand that, um, and I want to reiterate that this, uh, the content that I'm going to be presenting is somewhat of, a, of an adult subject, right? So I, I, I'm going to be treating you guys as the adults that I know that you are. Um, it's been somewhat sanitized. It's not going to be ultra graphic or anything along those lines, but we are still going to be discussing um, some adult topics. So what we wanted to do today is I'm going to give you a brief um, uh, talk basically on, on the structure of our, our laboratory here in Bear County, uh, the Bear County Criminal Investigation Laboratory. And then I want to discuss how forensics got to be where we're at, you know, the people that came before us, the, the giants upon the shoulders that we stand. So without further ado, let me get started. 
Uh, and uh, like, uh, like Tom said, we will have a Q&A at the end, so if I don't touch on anything, please do not be embarrassed, and please uh, feel free to ask your questions. Okay. So a little bit about my, my background real quick before we get started. I hold a Bachelor of Science degree in Biology from Texas Tech University. Get your guns up. Um, I have a, a Master of Science degree in Wildlife Science from Purdue University. Um, and I started with the Crime Lab in 1998. Forensic science is a, is a very interesting field, and it's one in which there's a lot of interest. So when I started with, in the crime lab, I needed to get my foot in the door, and I started as a forensic technician. It's the, it's the lowest level uh, technical position that we have in the laboratory. Um, so I started as a forensic technician. I was then promoted to a forensic scientist. I then worked my way up to become quality assurance manager, and then I was then promoted to assistant director in 2019, and I'm there since. So. Um, I highly encourage anybody that wants to pursue this field to do so, okay? This is where we currently work. This is the, the Bear County Forensic Science Center. Um, the crime laboratory is uh, what's known as a fee-for-service or a cost-sharing model that we wor do work for other agencies and then they reimburse Bear County for our work. Uh, it also housed in this building, which was built in 1993. At the time, it was a state-of-the-art building, but now it's almost 30 years old and it's starting to show its age. Um, we have the, um, the uh, crime laboratory as well as the Bear County Medical Examiner's Office. And so both of us are in, in desperate need of additional space, so that is in the, in the works in that um, we will be moving. We'll, oh, back, back up real quick, see if I can back up. Um, we only have 30 staff in the crime laboratory, so we, we service a population of 2 million people in Bear County. Uh, we're not a full service laboratory, we don't do fingerprints, we don't do other types of analyses that they um, do at other laboratories, but we do a lot. And we only do that, we do that with 30 staff. And again, we've been accredited, which is a requirement, uh, since 1998. What I can also say is that our laboratory um, has been uh, received an award for the past three years running. Um, it's an independent award um, done through Marshall University that looks at crime laboratories and how well they operate. And we have been given this award because we have been operating at greater than 90% efficiency. Uh, there were only 13 uh, laboratories out of 196 participants last year that received this uh, award. So that all credit goes to the staff. This is where we're going to be moving to. Um, this is uh, a building that the Bear County uh, government purchased uh, and is in the process of, of being renovated. It is down on the southwestern side of San Antonio. It's about a 42,000 square foot facility, which is great because currently the crime laboratory only operates in about 15,000 square feet. So it's going to almost triple the amount of space at our disposal uh, and that we will be possibly moving in in 2023. Uh, it all depends because it, you know, obviously the, the building will have to be renovated to uh, forensic science and crime laboratory standards. This is our logo. This is our, our, our patch. Okay, so the Bear County Crime Laboratory, um, this is what we have on our reports. This is what we represent ourselves by. And we have based this image on that from the Sheriff's Department. Okay. Um, the Bear County Sheriff's Office uses this patch, and in the center of this patch is what's called the Bear County Coat of Arms. Okay, that's the official coat of arms for Bear County, and it represents, um, if I can get this to advance, uh, the coat of arms of the Spanish Duke of Bear. It represents um, one of the missions, so it represents all of the missions. Uh, it has an eagle that represents both the United States and Mexico, and it has a cannon that represents that of the Republic of Texas. So what we did is we wanted to use that symbology and base ours on theirs. So we then modified theirs to include our imagery. So instead of the, the logo for the, the, the Duke of Bear that represents serology DNA, instead of the missions, we have a microscope for primer gunshot residue. Instead of an eagle, there's a, a illicit uh, drug, uh, marijuana leaf for drug identification, and then instead, ooh, instead of the cannon, it's a pistol for our firearms um, section. So these are the four sections that we're discussing uh, that our laboratory currently operates. And if you're at home or watching it on, from another place and you cannot hear these videos, these videos are also on um, 
the uh, Bear County YouTube uh, page. Um, but these videos were produced last year for uh, National Forensic Science Week. I think they do a really good job of introducing you to these sections. So, if, Aaron, if I can get you to start that video. Okay, and so like I said, those videos are available on, our, on the YouTube channel if you weren't able to hear those. And in the, in the audience, if you're a little bit difficult to, to listen, I apologize if we're having some issues with the, with the uh, speakers back there, but you just gotta listen. Okay, so uh, serology DNA. Historically, our job was to do two types of analysis. One was which to uh, analyze material for potential biological material, blood, semen, or saliva. Um, and we would do that separately before we would do DNA analysis. And we would process about a thousand requests a year, give or take. Okay? That's changing, and I'll explain why that's changing. Um, but then once we then uh, identified this biological material, the question would be, okay, well, whose is it? You've identified blood, you've identified semen, but that's not telling me a whole lot. I need to know whose it is. So the job of, of a forensic scientist is then to um, develop the, that genetic profile, be able to see, you know, what does the DNA say on that sample, and then compare that to someone else and see if they could be in included or excluded. And for those, uh, again, historically we were at analyzing just shy of a thousand case records a year. These have been going up. Um, as Bear County grows, um, crime is expected to grow as well and requests go up. So over time, we need to either improve our operation or we need to add more staff to be able to, add, um, to handle that, um, that caseload. Once we have identified a genetic profile, we can then enter that profile into a national database called the Combined DNA Index System, which I'll explain a little bit further out later. Uh, but it allows us to compare genetic profiles, not just within inside the laboratory, but across uh, the entire United States, and even potentially uh, internationally. Uh, and there's only nine individuals in the serology DNA section currently. So again, a population of two million people in Bear County, and you have nine individuals uh, that are essentially doing all DNA analysis for all of the county, as well as some of the surrounding uh, uh, municipalities. So these guys are amazing in the amount of work that they're able to do. The quality is exceptional. Um, so again, I can't say enough about the, the, the amazing staff that we have at the laboratory. In the past, um, sexual assault kits uh, would be examined um, manually. So it would take a lot of time. We would do a lot of chemical analysis, microscopic analysis, looking for sperm on, on bodily uh, swabs and slides. What we've done is we've recently implemented a direct-to-DNA 
uh, analysis of those samples. We're trying to speed up that process to be able to get the results quicker to the investigator as well as to the complainant and or the defendant as to say what, what did it actually say. So we're, we're, we're bypassing the conventional screening. Now we're going straight to DNA analysis. And this was uh, something that we've been highlighting this, uh, this week in, in National Forensic Science Week because Bear County made this investment to purchase this material for about a cost of, you know, just shy of $200,000. And we've been working on it for months to get it up and running. And so we're, we've been we're very proud and we think that it, we're working in the right direction. Once we have... Um, once we have isolated DNA, we can develop a genetic profile. And what we look at, this is, this is a, a, an example of a genetic profile. It's a little hard to see on, the, on the, the screen. It's a little washed out. But we analyzed 24 different regions that are in, uh, independently inherited. So what copy of one doesn't have anything to do with the copy of the other that you receive. Um, and so what we would generally do is identify a genetic profile from an, an unknown sample, say the semen that was taken on a vaginal swab or the blood that was collected from uh, a crime scene. Uh, we don't know where that material came from. We may have an idea, but no, we, they weren't there when, uh, when the material was deposited, so we're going to treat that as an unknown. We develop a genetic profile from that. Once that genetic profile is developed, we then compare that to a known sample that we do know came from the individual and compare them. If genetic profiles are different at any location of the 24 regions that we look at, we can say that that person is not the donor, it's someone else, okay? So essentially our job is to try to exclude someone as that donor. But if we can't, we need to tell the jury how rare that profile is. So for this profile, this is my genetic profile, okay? This is how many times you would expect this profile to occur once in a theoretical population, and that, that number is massive. That's 1.6 decillion people, okay? Does anybody have any idea how many people are actually on Earth? Yes? Just over seven billion, okay? So that's the, that's the estimate. Nobody knows because we haven't actually counted everybody, but that's the estimate. About seven billion, okay? on the whole earth, okay? So because of the rarity of this, this material, um, I can then offer an opinion to be able to say that, in my opinion, this DNA came from this individual, okay? I just broke this microphone. Okay, so the combined DNA index system came online in about 1998, um, and uh, what it does is uh, it is a, a national database where we can develop genetic profiles from unknown samples and put them into CODIS and compare those. So those unknown samples we can develop and put them into CODIS and we can search. So maybe we have two cases that match. Maybe we have uh, a serial offender that's, that's committing multiple offenses. This can be extremely important information for the investigator because they may not know that they've got the same person that's committing all this information or all these crimes. So when they then find that out, they can start sharing information amongst each other and maybe they can use that to help develop who the suspect is. But what the heart of CODIS is, is in the known database, which is the convicted offender um, and the convicted uh, arrestees state, uh, or arrestees database. Texas is an all-felon state, so if you are convicted of uh, committing any felony in the state, you are required to give a sample to the database. And Texas is moving to become an all-felon arrestee state. It's a slow process where um, it's not fully online, but if you're arrested for a, a, uh, an offense that qualifies, you can be put in the database immediately, okay? And the reason why this is important is because, uh, you know, Somebody is uh, released from prison, we have their sample on, on hand. Um, the recidivism rate is, is quite high amongst offenders. So once they're released, if they recommit, we can 
can then identify those individuals quickly. Okay, so moving on to another section, primer gunshot residue. Um, what this section does is they analyze evidence to look for material that was um, that came from a shooting, essentially. So it, it looks for material that is ejected from a, a gun uh, using scanning electron microscope with uh, with energies versus X-ray. They look at about 325 case records, and there's only two of them that do this full time. And again, they they're amazing in the amount of work that they're able to do. And what they what they can do is find some of these particles that are ejected when, when a firearm is fired that can get deposited on hands, on clothing, inside a car if it was used in a drive-by, and we can look to see if it was present. This is what essentially what we would be looking for is a, a, something of a spherical nature, a very small size, that has a combination of, of three elements, um, lead, barium, and antimony. If we see something of this size that has this material, we have identified primer gunshot residue. That doesn't mean that somebody has committed a crime, right? Texas, we have a Second Amendment state. You know, the, the Second Amendment in the United States allows for the, the, the legal possession and use of firearms. So someone may have been legally using a firearm. That may be the reason why they have um, primer gunshot residue on their body. But if they're suspected of being involved in, say, a drive-by shooting, and we find primer gunshot residue inside the vehicle, uh, that could be important information. Okay, so moving on to the next section here, if I can get you to start this one. Well, my name is Maureen Oliva and I'm a forensic scientist here at the Bear County Crime Lab in the chemistry section working with controlled substances. My name's Hannah Maselli. Um, I am a forensic scientist here at the Bear County Crime Lab and I work with drug identification. test what is seized in cases of, you know, possession, child endangerment, things like that. We need to make sure it is in fact a drug, in fact cocaine, in fact methamphetamine. And so we do this because this is in a controlled environment. Well, we get a lot of stuff here, uh, a lot of unknowns and we'll take those unknowns and try to tell you if it is a controlled substance or if it isn't. And that's pretty much what we do here. Forensic science is basically using all these different sciences that we've used for many years to solve a puzzle. thing about scientists we don't really see anything as it's technical a second. She'll be right back. We'll be right back. We'll be right back. It'll be good. It's a commercial break. Yeah. It's a <laughs> yeah. so it'll, it'll be that broke. So one number to remember. Oh, remember. You should do it. You should go up on the screen. No, you might not remember. That's cool. <laughs> Uh, you, know, you guys know Bill Gates, right? Okay. Bill Gates, they were they were they were demonstrating their new newfangled <laughs> Windows software, this, this release, and in the process of it, the whole thing crashed. We got the blue screen to death. So <laughs> it's great. Thank <laughs> you. 
Uh, okay. Tom. Tom. legal and, and chemical uh, scientific classification. Um, and they analyze about 7,000 case records a year. Um, they, are, they are the workforce in terms of the number of cases that come through the laboratory. Uh, but there are seven analysts. So essentially, each analyst is analyzing about 1,000 cases a year. Right? Um, we are also the first laboratory in the state of Texas to be able to differentiate between hemp and marijuana. Um, and this, um, like I said, we're the first publicly funded uh, laboratory in Texas to be able to, to, to do this type of analysis. Okay, so then, let's see if my video is going to crash. Cross your fingers. on the YouTube channel for Bear County. Uh, I do recommend that you, you see them. Uh, I, I like to showcase my staff. One thing that you would notice through these videos, all of them, um, is that uh, the, the, the scientists that are interviewed in those individual videos is that they're, they're all women. When I first got into forensic science, we had 14% of our analysts were women. There were two, right? Now there's only over 61% of our analysts are women, and that's across the board in all in, in crime labs across the country, is that women are, seem to be gravitating towards this field, and I highly encourage it. They're, they're wonderful, wonderful scientists. So it's a great, it's a great field to get into. Um, in firearms and tool marks, uh, what we do is uh, they analyze material that may be from a, uh, some type of a shooting, maybe homicide, aggravated assault, um, and they are able to look to see if a uh, particular gun may have fired that material. And they do that through the use of a comparison light microscope here seen on the screen. When a, when a firearm is fired, or when a, any tool is used on a softer material, it leaves markings. And a firearm, uh, those markings are unique, and it's randomly created in the manufacturing process. Studies have been done of sequentially manufactured firearms, sequentially manufactured barrels, um, other components. And each one is unique because in that process, small little uh, differences occur. And those can be seen um, with, a, with a comparison light microscope. Uh, they analyze just shy of 500 case records a year, and there are three of them. Okay? So this is the type of thing that they would be looking for under a comparison light microscope, you would have a... That'll wake you up, man. Um, you have a known bullet on one side of the image, and you have an unknown bullet on the other side. Maybe this unknown was taken at autopsy. Okay? So what we would then do is compare that known bullet side by side visually to that of the unknown bullet. And if those markings are different, you could say it's not the bullet. It's not the, this is not where this bullet from autopsy came from. They did not originate in the same firearm. But if you can see these lines, they're called stria, um, basically scraping marks, is what happens is that bullet has been passed down a barrel. And as it's gone through the barrel, it's riding on these what are called lanes um, that causes the bullet to spin, right? But it picks up these markings. 
and those markings are unique and can be used for identification purposes. We can also do the same with the breech face. So this is a firing pin impression. So the firing pin struck a primer, and then you also have these markings on the, on the, fire, uh, on the uh, primer itself as well. And so again, we've got a known compared to an unknown, and those markings line up and match. So we could say that those were fired from the same firearm. And I'm going to skip over that video because I'm going to get on the radar to crash. I can. Okay. So moving on to the second part of the topic, um, I wanted to talk about uh, what I call the giants in forensic science. These are the these are the, the kind of the, the 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 guys that started the, these uh, specific disciplines, and so uh, there's a there's a phrase that says you know we stand upon the shoulders of giants, that the work that individuals did before us uh, has cleared the way to allow us to do the work that we're currently doing, and hopefully you guys become giants in some other arena that the people that come after can stand upon your shoulders, um, and the the, the list that I'm gonna talk about it was actually developed by a guy by the name of Richard Safferstein. Here's a, there's a seminal textbook out there if you, have, if you wanna to try to get a, a copy of it, uh, Criminalistics and Introduction to Forensic Science. Richard himself was a, was a giant in that he helped try to uh, uh, create a lot of this material for, for a, you know, a lay audience. And he died in 2017. Um, so uh, he and himself is, is, is considered a giant. But I wanna start with a guy by the name of Edmund Locard. Edmund Locard is a Frenchman, and uh, he uh, created the very first crime laboratory in Lyon, France, in around 1910. He worked as both a doctor and a lawyer, um, and he contributed to many, many, many different uh, types of forensic analysis. He was considered and still called the Sherlock Holmes of France, okay? And, but what he's really famous for is what's called Locard's exchange principle, which states that when two objects come in contact, material is going to be transferred between the two. So he did these studies with these metal balls coated in like a powder, one blue, one red, say, and you smash them together, and some of the red powder would get passed, transferred to the, to the blue ball, and some of the blue powder would get transferred to the red ball, etc. But this is what forensic science is all founded on, that something is left behind. Everything leaves a trace, okay? So when you touch an object, you're leaving latent prints. Um, you could be leaving bodily material, shed hair, shed, you know, you, could, you spit on something, you're gonna be leaving your DNA behind. So all of this is based on ex Locard's exchange principle. So he was, you know, again, the giant of the giants. He also worked in conjunction with a guy, with a guy by the name of Alphonse Bernard, which I will have to say has a magnificent mustache. I mean, look at it, it's just magnificent. Um, Bertillon, he was a photographer and a police officer, and he, de uh, he partnered with Locard, and he developed the mugshot, right? It's one of the, the, the things that he's famous for, you know, things that are still in use today. Um, but you also have to think back in the day, there were no standards like we have to follow now. These guys were winging it. They were coming up with stuff on, you know, from the seat of their pants. And there was a famous case in France called the Dreyfus Affair, or the Fayard Dreyfus. And it was a guy by the name of uh, Dreyfus uh, who was convicted of treason. Um, and uh, on a lot of really bad forensic analysis, most of it handwriting analysis, where he didn't match at all. But the judge said, well, he knew, and so he made sure that he, he disguised his writings and so whatnot. So um, Alphonse Bertillon testified incorrectly in that case. He was not a for, uh, handwriting expert, um, but a lot of these guys, like I say, were, were making it up as they went. But he also developed the first method of being able to truly identify someone based on their physical characteristics. Now we use fingerprints, but at the time he developed what he called anthropometry, which was a measurement 
of different types of bodily, you know, structures. The length of your forearm, the length of your index finger, length, uh, the circumference of your head kind of thing. Each one of which would be what we would call a class characteristic, because there are other people that would have those measurements. But taken in combination, the idea is that you would then weed out enough people that you would get to the point of being able to identify someone. It was real clunky. It was hard to do. The, the measuring devices had to, you know, subject to, to variability. Um, but it was the best thing that was available at the time. It started to go out of, out of uh, favor in terms of fingerprints, because fingerprints were just easier to do. But what killed it was this case in 1903. There was a guy by the name of William West who was convicted uh, and sent to Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary in Kansas. And when they got there, they started taking measurements or whatnot. And they said, okay, yeah, we got him, William West. But wait a second, he's already here. We already have Will West with these measurements. That's Will West. That's Will West. They are not related. And they have the exact same measurements based on anthropometry. So they could not differentiate these two individuals based on this type of analysis. They look very much the same. So imagine one of them comes up for parole. Which one do you let go? You know, the one that, you know, that, that truly is the one that's up for parole or the other one? You can't identify them. They would have different fingerprints. Um, identical twins have different fingerprints. Okay. Another guy, uh, this guy's a toxicologist, his name was Matthew Orfila. Um, he was uh, a Spaniard. And um, he, there was a famous case. Um, he, he did create a lot of new techniques, and he testified in a case of uh, Marie Lafarge. She was a French woman uh, who was suspected of, of poisoning and killing her husband. Um, by feeding him arsenic. And so they found arsenic on the farm. Okay, they lived on a farm. That, arsenic at the time was commonly used to kill rats. So they found arsenic in the farm. They found arsenic in the food, right? But the question is, did this man consume this food? Is this what killed him? And so there, were, there had been tests that were performed that showed that there was no arsenic in this person's blood. Right? So they couldn't say that he actually um, ate it. And so they had brought in Matthew Orfila as a defense expert to be able to say that, that he didn't do it. But then when he started to review the case, he noticed that the test was done wrong. Right? So he redid the test on material that was left over from the, from the decedent. And lo and behold, there was arsenic in this individual, and so the, uh, that was used to, then against Marie Lafarge, she was then convicted uh, of murdering her husband. Francis Galton, um, he was an Englishman, half-cousin to Charles Darwin. Um, in fact, Darwin is the one that recommended that, Gal that Dalton uh, start looking into this field uh, of fingerprints. He was not the first one to study fingerprints. There were some other guys by the name of uh, William Herschel and Henry Folds. In fact, people had been using fingerprints for, for centuries, uh, especially in the East, to be able to sign documents. So it seems that they recognized that each person's fingerprints are unique. And he wrote a book um, called Fingerprints. But he was the first one to show statistically that um, based on these individual characteristics on the fingerprint, that uh, these are unique traits and that uh, they can be used for, for individual identification. Okay? Albert Osborne, he was a handwriting um, penmanship uh, teacher. Uh, and while he was teaching people how to have proper penmanship, this is before computers and whatnot, and penmanship used to actually be very important. You look at these documents, historical documents, and people have the most beautiful handwriting. None of us can write like that any longer. Um, but Albert Osborne taught these types of techniques. And so based on his analysis of, of how people wrote, he started to create um, the, the field of question document examination. He authored a book that's still used for question document examination. Um, 
And uh, he also was the founding member of a society that's still around that, that does um, certify question document examiners, the Society of Question Document Examiners. But one of his famous cases was involving the, uh, the kidnapping of Charles Lindbergh's baby. I don't know if you know about Charles Lindbergh. But Charles Lindbergh was the first man to fly solo across the Atlantic, right? This was a huge thing at the time. Flew the spirit of St. Louis um, from New York um, to Paris. And this was an absolute massive thing because now it meant that travel could actually go across the Atlantic very quickly. And uh, Charles Lindbergh was the most famous man in the world at the time. And someone broke into his home and kidnapped his infant son and was um, ransoming for the release of this baby. And so they would re receive these letters. Oh, they would receive these letters and Albert Osborne was, they ended up cap uh, arresting a guy by the name of Bruno Hauptmann, who was a German immigrant. There were some interesting things in the way that he wrote that led people to believe that he was German in the way that he spoke. Um, and so they arrested Bruno Hauptmann, and uh, this is an example of the analysis of Hauptmann's individual writings versus that of the, uh, of the ransom note. And this was used at trial to convict uh, Hauptmann as well as other things. And so Albert Osborne was, was one of the, the people that was involved in that analysis. Calvin Goddard was an army colonel who refined firearms analysis. He was the first one to employ that comparison uh, microscope that I showed you earlier. Um, and that's, again, that is the most important tool in a firearms examiner's arsenal. That's, they spend a lot of time on the microscope. Um, he first he established uh, what was known as the Bureau of Forensic Ballistics in New York City. It was the first independent crime laboratory in the United States. But one of his famous cases was that of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre um, in, oh, I'm not getting the image there. Um, the the St. Valentine's Day Massacre in Chicago. Uh, this was a case involving likely um, uh, Scarface, which I forget, I'm blanking on his name. Um, the, the mobster, Al Capone. So a rival gang had been massacred on, on Valentine's Day, um, and um, they collected a bunch of uh, cartridge cases from the scene. There were 70 cartridge cases of a certain caliber, 45 caliber round. And what Goddard was able to do, even without a gun, he was able to examine those, um, the, that evidence and say that all of, these evi all of this evidence came from two guns. Okay, so only two guns fired these 70 rounds, and both of those guns were Thompson submachine guns. Thompsons were very famous at the time for uh, being involved in, in, in mob activity. Um, but they, he said, this is what you're looking for. You're looking for two uh, Thompson submachine guns. And later on, they, they, they arrested a, a known mobster who had in his possession two Thompson submachine guns. And then when that comparison was done, he was able to then identify that those two guns were the ones that fired those rounds. So he was able to do that without even having the guns to begin with, right? Just based on the evidence alone, give an uh, investigational lead to, uh, to the detective. Walter McCrone uh, was a microscopist. He taught um, trace examiners how to uh, do different types of techniques um, to be able to determine what types of fibers they are, whether they match um, glass, uh, paint, all these different types of, of trace materials using microscopic techniques. He um, also then founded the McCrone Institute, which still exists today. Uh, Walter McCrone died in 2002, but that the, uh, the McCrone Institute still exists. And so it's still a location where uh, forensic scientists that are, wanting going, that are wanting to go into the trace evidence discipline go to be trained. Leon Latz, his work base was based on uh, work of, of another guy, so another giant that upon his shoulders he's standing, a guy by the name of Dr. Carl Landsteiner. Landsteiner noticed that 
people knew for, for centuries that if, if, you, if you gave a blood transfusion to another individual, direct blood and transfusion from one person to another, sometimes it worked fine. Sometimes it killed the person dead. No idea why. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And it wasn't until Carl Landsteiner discovered and described ABO blood typing, although he called it ABC blood typing, which makes sense, but C ended up becoming O. He won the Nobel Prize for that because that was landmark, right? Because now it, that helps the field of medicine immensely. What Leon Latz was able to do was show that those blood groups are still present, at least for a period of time, in dried stains. So most forensics analysis is going to be done well after the, uh, the crime has occurred. So what Leon Latz was able to do is say that, look, we can take this material that was collected at crime, we can still develop ABO uh, blood typing, and we can determine whether somebody may be the donor or not. Um, he also was the first one to be able to use that uh, to describe whether somebody may be the parent or not. So um, to do uh, a paternity analysis of a deceased individual. Okay, and lastly, but definitely not least, um, my favorite guy on the list, uh, guy, the only one that's still alive, <laughs> is Sir Alec Jeffers. Okay, and uh, I'm a DNA analyst, uh, still in my heart, even though I haven't done it in years. Um, but Sir Alec Jeffries was the first one to develop, oh, <laughs> so hang on. Oh, let's back up. If I can. Um, Alec Jeffers was the first one to develop uh, what he called, unfortunately, DNA fingerprinting. And the reason why I called it DNA fingerprinting is because we knew that fingerprints are unique. So these, um, um, so he called it DNA fingerprinting. The very first use of um, DNA analysis uh, in a forensic setting was involving, there was um, two separate uh, sexual assaults and murders that occurred in a very small, um, very small village in England. That's okay, I'm almost at the end of the presentation. Um, at the, in a very small village in England, and uh, they happened a few years apart. And on the second one, they had developed a suspect who was somewhat mentally challenged, and the police were able to get a partial confession out of this individual to say that he had committed these crimes. And without Alec Jeffries' work, it's highly likely that that individual would have been convicted and sent to prison for the crime. But when Alec Jeffries did DNA analysis, you know, they, they were able to show that it was the same genetic profile from the two crimes for years apart, so they knew it was the same individual. But this was not that person. The genetic uh, profiles were different. So based on that, the very first use of DNA analysis in a forensic setting was to exclude the suspect, which is just as important as catching the bad guy, right? None of us want someone to go to jail when, for a crime that they did not commit. So all of forensics is about the study of the truth. All we want to do is to provide that truth to the finder of fact, the jury, to determine guilt or innocence. So in this case, again, this person likely would have, would have been convicted. And so this, there's a, a famous book, it's called The Blooding, um, by, it was written by Joseph Wombaugh, um, and what it does is it describes this case. The perpetrator of this case ended up being a guy by the name of Colin Pitchfork, which is the greatest name, I think, of, you know, in, in crime. Colin Pitchfork. And he almost got away with it, too, because when they were taking known samples from the population, he sent somebody else in his place to go have his blood drawn and act as though he was calling Pitchfork. And the blood was taken, but this guy later went to a bar, had a few pints, and started bragging about what they had done, somebody overheard. And so then they actually did get a, a better sample from Colin Pitchfork, and he was, ended up being uh, matched to those samples. So they were able to identify that. 
So, oh, we're back. And then, like I say, uh, the bloody. Okay, so. Okay, so you want to become a forensic scientist, right? Everybody wants to become a forensic scientist. I hear it all. You know, what do I what, what kind of class or degree uh, do I need to study in college to become a forensic scientist? And the answer is science, right? No, you know, if you're wanting to work in a crime laboratory, you need to hammer the sciences. Absolutely hammer the sciences, okay? So, we have requirements that to become a forensic scientist um, generally requires at least a bachelor of science degree in one of the one of the, the natural sciences, biology, chemistry, physics, etc. But the vast majority of uh, what the population is moving towards is that most forensic scientists do have master's degrees. Most of uh, my staff in the scientific community have, um, have master's degrees. So when we do have an opening, remember we only have 30 staff. So when we have an opening, we'll get dozens, if not 100 plus applications of people wanting to, to, to work for us. And a lot of them have master's degrees. So you have to be able to to separate yourself from the pack. You need to be able to get that interview to be able to shine. So I do recommend that if you're wanting to go into forensics, go ahead and plan on getting your master's degree first off, okay? But what I also recommend that you do is go on the Texas Forensic Science Commission's website. Texas is one of, uh, it's unique in the way that, um, that we operate that Texas is required that all forensic laboratories performing work for court have to be accredited, so you have to follow certain requirements. But we're also the only one that requires our analysts to be licensed, right? And that licensing requirement means that you have to meet certain educational requirements. So if you go on this website, you can see exactly what that, what that entails. Um, and so, you, you, if you meet all those requirements, you're going to be really in a good position to be able to then potentially go into a crime lab once you're once all said and done. Now, do you have any questions? Are there any questions online, first off? Do you guys have any questions? I got one here. It's a really good question. Okay, so the question, if you, if you couldn't hear it, is it common for evidence to become contaminated during analysis? And the answer to that is no, okay? It is not common for evidence to become contaminated. Uh, we, have, we have known standards that we follow, cleaning protocols, as well as we run different controls to be able to show that uh, if a contamination event occurred. Um, now, we can't, we can't run those prior to them coming into the laboratory. We're not a crime scene um, uh, laboratory. We don't actually go and collect the samples. So whether something may have happened prior to coming into the laboratory um, is, you know, we can't say. There can be um, sometimes, and we don't, there's different types of contamination. There's contamination from other samples. There's also like for a DNA analyst, our own sample showing up, our own DNA showing up in a sample. That sometimes can occur at a very low level, um, but we are, we are able to distinguish our own sample, our own DNA, um, from that of, the, of the, uh, the crime scene sample, and then that sample can always be reprocessed if necessary. But that's a very good question. Thank you. There was another question, I think. Back. Yes? Yes? Okay, so the question was, what if you're, what if you're, what if you're good at chemistry, but bad at biology, which is a great question, okay? Become a chemist, okay? <laughs> so, I'm a biologist. I'm horrible at chemistry, okay? I passed, I've got, I, I've got some C's <laughs> in my transcript. It's okay, you know? You don't have to be perfect to be able to pass, 
right? The main thing is you get the degree. That's a wonderful question because we all have our strengths. Lean into your strengths and lean away from your weaknesses for something like that. So if you're, if you're not interested in biology, don't pursue biology. Go chemistry and vice versa. But that's a great question. Yes, ma'am. The question was, what steps would you get, would you take to get started? And that's also a very good question. The first thing I would say, the first steps is just study your, your classwork, right? That's the main thing you've got to do. You've got to, you got to pass your classes. You've got to graduate. Um, but once you're getting close to completion, there are internship programs that are out there in the forensic community. Um, you may have to go away for a period of time. You may need to go somewhere else. So the main thing is you need to get your foot in the door. And so you've got to be willing to travel to where the openings are, right? I'll be with you in just one second. Um, you, you may not be able to just say, I'm going to live where I've always grown up, right? Said so we have 30 total positions in the Bear County Crime Lab, and we're the only game in town in, in San Antonio. So if you were to say, well, I'm going to stay here until an opening comes up, I wouldn't recommend it. I would recommend that you be willing to go wherever you can to get experience. Once you've got that experience, you're, you've got your foot in the door, then you can choose where you want to go next. But that's also a great question. I've got one over here, red shirt. Question, question was, what do we make annually? And that's a great question, and the answer is not enough. Um, so a forensic scientist um, for us at the Bear County Crime Lab, well, generally we're hiring somebody straight out of college. And again, we're oftentimes hiring somebody that has a master's degree. Our, the starting salary for that position starts at $45,000. But one thing that we do have that sets us a bit apart from other laboratories is we have what we call the career path. And so you can easily move from a forensic scientist one to a forensic scientist five in a number of years just by doing certain steps. So within a very short amount of time, you can promote through the system and each promotion you get a pretty significant pay bump. But in my opinion, I still believe that we're underpaid for the amount of work that, that our staff is performing, as well as the, the, you know, what they're being asked to do. But we're not in it for the money, honestly. We're not. The, the people that got into this field, we could be making a lot more money doing other things. We chose to do this because we feel like we're making a difference in our community. When you, when you leave work at the end of the day, you feel amazing because maybe it was what you did that day that helped solve something. I've got a case that, um, I've got a few cases in my past that um, I, I was asked to analyze some cold cases from the, in the 1980s. And based on my analysis, we were able to solve these homicides from the 1980s. And that felt amazing when you go home and realize that the families of the, the, the deceased have lived for 20 plus years not knowing who killed their loved one and not knowing if they were going to ever be brought, brought to justice. But the investigating agencies never stopped investigating those cases. We never stopped analyzing those cases. And then we were able to then identify material that matched to someone else. And those, both of those cases, one did go to court um, and was, uh, he was convicted. Um, one, the guy, in the, one, he never even, uh, he just pled no contest to it. Um, and so it never even went to trial. So again, we don't, we don't go into it for the money. The money's nice, y'all. Uh, I had one. The question was, are there any certain requirements other than educational requirements? The, other, the only other requirements I would say is that you have to be able to pass a background check, okay? So don't do anything really, really, really bad. That's not gonna let you pass a background check. There are certain types of, you know, like 
things that can be brushed off as youthful indiscretion, some, but the main thing is you need to be able to pass a background check. The question was, do we work closely with forensic nurses? And, and the answer is somewhat. Okay, so I'm a member of what we call the Sexual Assault Response Team for Bear County. And that's a, a consolidation of investigating agencies, laboratories, and SANE nurses, or sexual assault nurse examiners. Those nurses and the people, the crime scene analysis, they're the front line of defense. They're the ones that are collecting this evidence that allows us to be able to do the, the work. And SANE nurses do not get enough credit because not only are they uh, collecting the evidence in a certain way that that make sure that the evidence is retained and able to be analyzed later, they're the ones that are helping an individual that may have just gone through a very traumatic experience. So those nurses are amazing. But yes, uh, we do work somewhat in, in hand in hand with them, but since we're an independent organization, we all kind of do our part and we just have a little bit of overlap. That's a really good question. Any other questions? I got one there. Uh, what does a typical day at work look like? A typical day at work, um, we, fortunately for us, uh, and I can only speak for my laboratory, uh, is that um, we're not on call. We don't do crime scene analysis. So you do have a set schedule. Uh, and currently we don't, we're not running shifts. Right, so our, our laboratory essentially runs, our official hours are from eight to five, but we allow our staff to m move their time somewhat because people have lives, right? You got families, you got kids. So some start as early as 6 a.m., some work till a little after five, but the, it's, it's a 40 hour work week and how, um, how they get it done. But one of the great things about it is that um, because we're not on call, we do actually get to have lives outside of work, right? So you get to go home and unplug. And, and I don't watch the, the CSI shows and I don't read that stuff because I live that at the, at, at the lab. I don't want my outside life to be that. You know, so I'm, a, I'm an absolute geek. You know, my kids and I watch anime and I, and I read a lot of fantasy novels. Yeah. The white shirt person and Yes. How accurate are the CSI shows to your job? So the question is how accurate are the CSI shows to my job? And honestly, I don't watch them. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but what I can tell you, what I can tell you is that it does take time. Um, you know, analyses take time. You know, people are conditioned to, to see these shows and they're expecting results immediately, right? Good proper analysis needs to be done slowly and deliberatively. It needs to make sure that we're following certain standards and that we're recording things in a way that we can use that later on. So if you came and watched us work, you'd probably be bored, honestly, because it's, it's, it's a slow, deliberative process. Um, but it's, it, those shows have done a really good thing about getting people interested in the field. When I first got into forensics, I got into it before the CSI shows came on board, right? What got me interested in it was I was in a, a, a senior at Texas Tech uh, when the OJ trial was going on, okay? So the OJ Simpson trial had a whole lot of forensic analysis, and this was the first time that most of the population was introduced to it. So that's what got me interested in it, and that's, that's how, I, how I got into it. So I wish I could answer your question better, but I can't. The question is, do I think OJ did it? Um, I can give you my personal opinion, right? I can't give you that opinion based on, on, on other things. But as a, as a, as a joke, uh, me and a, a group of other forensic scientists years ago said that we were going to uh, start a band, and that's our name, what is going to be our name, was that OJ did it. Um, yes, based on the forensic analysis, it it's, would be 
you know, highly likely. But I'm not, I was not the trier of fact, I was not the finder of fact, but the, there's a lot of forensic evidence pointing to the fact that likely he, he did. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Oh, I can't answer that one. I have no idea. The question was, do I think Princess Diana was murdered? I, again, I don't, have, I don't I, I'm not doing deep dives in other historical stuff. So, but yeah. You guys have good questions, though. I got two back here. Let's go with the guy first. I haven't had a, a guy question in a while. How long are you going to have a beard? <laughs> Thank you. The question was, how long have I been growing up a beard? Um, Started it last summer. Yeah, so uh, it's just fun and silly. I've got nothing up top. So if you got it, play with it, man. You know, so grow your hair, do what you want. It's all good. The question is an excellent question. Does the job take a mental toll on us? And the answer is it can, yeah. Um, we're not, a lot of times when we're analyzing evidence, we're not seeing the immediate impact. You know, we're not going to the crime scenes, we're not seeing crying families, we're not, like, the people that are, that, you know, let's say for example, the medical examiners that, that, that we work uh, hand in hand with, they have to, deal very, in a very respectful manner with very difficult subjects with families who are grieving, right? We're human. It's going to affect us. You know, it does weigh on us. Um, and there is also what's known as uh, vicarious trauma, that by seeing certain things, you come to expect that type of behavior. And we do see our responses in, in real life based in some ways on things that we know about what's happened in other places. So yes, it can. There are, there are resources. And the good thing is, is that as with all mental health, it should be taken very seriously. People should be getting any support that they absolutely need. It should not be a stigma. So. It's getting to the point where people can get that assistance easier. So that's a good thing. Okay, I got, do I have time for one more? I got to go to the, to the, to the, I think her hand came up first. Yes, ma'am. Do I think Breaking Bad is historically accurate? <laughs> I was actually going to go for Halloween one year as, as Heisenberg, because I used to just, I used to just have the goatee, but now I grew this out, and I, I can't, so anyway, thank you all. His employee, uh, he's just uh, He calls his employees rock stars. I think Aaron's a rock star. So, everybody, really, thank you. Uh, thank you for thank you for all your questions, for your interest. This is. I, I told you earlier a little bit about my own background and knowing what Aaron and his coworkers do in the lab. In that space that none of us typically ever see is so incredibly important. When you sit in a room with victims, when you sit in a room with relatives of a victim, and they're waiting for answers that you as an investigator cannot give them. And you have to rely on the work and on the quality of the work because everything will be tested rightfully so in court. You have to rely on the work that is done in these crime labs. It's absolutely incredible. And uh, I, I personally think they don't get enough credit, so I'm, I'm very happy that we could introduce this to you. This is the second year that we're doing National Forensic Science Week, uh, that we're celebrating it in Bear County. 
We're already excited and looking forward to next year. So we're going to do it again, and uh, hopefully, maybe Marshall will have us again. We'll see. Uh, so uh, with that, I'll simply close it, say thank you very much, and you all have a wonderful show. <laughs>